Our Father, we thank you for the challenge you have given us. And we thank you for the challenges you are still going to give us in your word. We come now humbly to the study of your word. And we are praying, O oh Lord, you teach us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Those things you have written and those things you have in your word reserved for us, for our development and growth, for our coming nearer and nearer unto you in relationship, revealed to every heart in Jesus' name. We know that you have answered and we'll see the result in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. In our series of Bible teachings, for this time, we have chosen the first epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Thessalonians. I considered quite a lot of other passages before the Lord said we should settle on this. And it's uh, for a particular purpose. As we look at this church, the church to the Thessalonians, you'll find that Paul the Apostle was very happy, he rejoiced over the church. And he rejoiced because of the fruit of the Spirit he saw in the church. And he saw that the Lord blessed their ministry in that uh, church, in that city. And it actually becomes a model church for us as we enter into the new millennium. I want you to have a feel of the way he wrote to them and see the joy he expressed in every chapter. First Thessalonians, look at it from chapter 1 verse 3. It says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. You understand? He had said before in uh, First Corinthians, there are three things. Faith, hope, love. Of these, the greatest is love. And then he tells us now, concerning these Thessalonian believers, he said, I'm rejoicing because I remember your work of faith, the faith that works, and then your labor of love, the love that labors. And then I remember to you, your hope, the patience of hope, the hope that perseveres. And then in chapter 2, verse 13, for this cause also, thank we God, without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which ye, which ye had of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Obviously, you ought to rejoice over them because the word of God was working effectively, effectually in them. He said, there's something I remember about you that makes me happy every, every time I remember you. That is, when you had the word of God, you received it as it is, the very word of God, and I see it's bearing fruit in your life. It worketh effectually in chapter 3, reading from verse 5. Here it says, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter has tempted you, and our labor be in vain, because they were there for just a short time. He appeared actually in the synagogue of the Jews, three Sabbaths. And uh, then he taught them in the city. And because of persecution, they were driven out of the place. He started wondering about them. Are they able to stay? Is the faith sustained? Are they standing in the Lord? Are they remaining in the foundation of the faith that had been preached unto them? He said, we became so bothered. We needed to send Timothy unto you. Then he said in verse 6, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and of your charity that ye have good remembrance of us always desiring greatly to see us as we also uh, to see you therefore brethren we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith uh, you will see from chapter 1 chapter 2 chapter 3 how he rejoiced over them as he gets to chapter 4 he couldn't get over the joy that he had over these people chapter 4 verse 9 here he says but as touching brotherly love 
ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, in verse 10, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. And then it says, but now we're beseeching you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. He was so happy over them. Every chapter, he kept on talking about their faith. He kept on talking about their love. In chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another as also ye do. It says, I'm bringing the exhortation to you, not because you are negligent, not because you are not doing as you ought to do, even as you do, it was only encouraging them, continue. You see then in chapters 1 to 5, here was a church. A church that Paul the Apostle was happy about. He wrote to other churches, you know. He wrote to the Galatians. And almost from the first chapter, he began to complain about them. He wrote to the Corinthians. And you will see all throughout. I'm hearing reports about you. This shouldn't be. This shouldn't be. If I had been with you, this is what I will do. And I'll be coming with you with a rod. And he wrote to others. And he says, I must put this right. I must put this right. You must take on the faith but writing to the Thessalonians he was so happy there was nothing to rebuke them about just put this down in introduction number one it was a worthy church worthy of the name by which they were called number two it was a church walking in love the labor of love w-o-r-k-i-n-g they were walking in love number three they were walking in the light you see he had given them the light of the gospel and they had that word of God and the light was there and they were consistently walking in the light. Number four, they were a witness in church. He in fact said in chapter one, he said, the gospel is gone about and you have trumpeted it. You have said so, so, so much about it. And even when we go to places, we do not have anything to say anymore because you are doing the work. Number five, it was a church worshiping the Lord. It said, you have turned from idols and now you are serving the Lord and you are worshiping the true and the living God. Number six, it was a church watching. They were watching, number seven, and waiting. They were waiting for the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord. I want you to come back to chapter one. And I'll be full of what he was writing to them. In chapter 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. Unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, we're thanking God, we're praising God and rejoicing. We thank God, all, we, we give thanks to God always for you all. And making mention of you in our prayers. He's been interceding, he's been praying for them. This is the church we're looking at. And we're looking at chapter 1 today. In chapter 1, we're looking at the evidence and the signs of genuine conversion. If ever anyone was converted, if ever any church had converted people, the church of the Thessalonians had converted people. And we're looking for the signs. We're looking for uh, the, 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 the evidence of genuine conversion. That means as your ministers and leaders in your churches, you're going back to your churches and there are some things we'll be looking for. Our people, are they born again? Are they serving the Lord? Are they really converted? Have they turned to the Lord? Is there a mighty change in them? Is our ministry in our various locations and countries, is it bearing fruit? First Thessalonians will tell us. There are three points we're going to consider as we've divided chapter 1 into three parts. Number one, the enduring commitment of faithful ministers. The enduring commitment of faithful ministers. Number two, extraordinary conversions through a fruitful ministry extraordinary conversions through a fruitful ministry number three exemplary characteristics of a fair model we're looking at this church as a model and as we look at this church as a fair model we want to see the exemplary characteristics of that fair model number one the enduring commitment of faithful ministers you see in uh, uh, verse 1 there it mentions three people it says paul and silvanus 
and Timotheus. Stop there for a moment. Here you find companions in the faith. Here you find companions in the ministry. And these companions in the ministry, they're working together. And it's not anything surprising, actually. As you go through the Bible, you'll find that God brings people together. You're thinking of Moses and Aaron. You're thinking of Joshua and Caleb. You're thinking of David and Jonathan. And you're thinking of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're thinking of Peter and, and John. And you're thinking about and now Paul and Timothy and, and uh, Silvanus, which means Silas. People coming together, but then we notice something that as they came together, there was a common characteristic. What do you find concerning uh, these uh, men? Uh, I've already said it in the subtitle, the enduring commitment of faithful ministers. There is one adjective that qualifies them. They were faithful. Look at it one by one in First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me, what's the next word? Faithful, putting me into the ministry. You'll find that in the life and the ministry of Paul the Apostle, there's one word you can talk about him. You can, uh, you can place on him. It's the word faithful. Let's look at the second man because he tells us in First Thessalonians, we're writing to you. We came to you, we ministered unto you, and Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus were writing together unto you. Now look at First Peter chapter 5, verse 12. First Peter chapter 5, verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying this, that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. Concerning Paul, we have the word faithful. Concerning Silvanus, uh, which means Silas, we have the word faithful. And then now concerning Timothy, in First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. It tells us, For this cause have I sent unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved, who is uh, my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord. So then, we learn something about these three people that were coupled together, joined together in ministry to the people of God in Thessalonica. They were faithful. Now, what it say, when it says faithful, what does that mean? It means, as we look at the other parts of the Bible, number one, they were faithful unto the Lord that appointed them. The Lord that appointed them, he had given them a commission, he had given them something to do, and they were always having the Lord before them. And they knew that the Lord was watching them, looking at the motive, looking at the method, looking at the message, looking at the ministry, looking at everything they did, and they said, the Lord is watching. The Lord is a kind of examining everything. We need to be faithful to the Lord that has appointed us. You look at your life and your ministry. And right there when you are far away. And all the people are not there to examine what you are doing. Scrutinize what you are doing. Are you faithful to the Lord that has appointed you? Number one. Uh, number two rather. Uh, he, they were faithful in all his house. That's another thing we learn in the word of God. Numbers 12 verse 7 that Moses was faithful in all his house. And all these uh, three two, these three companions in the ministry and in the faith, they said, we're in the house of God. This is his house. This is his temple. He has apportioned our ministry unto us, and the things that need to be done will be faithful in all his house. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35, the Lord himself said, I'm going to raise up priests, and there is something that is going to happen to them. They will do according to my own heart and to my mind. And that is what you find about Paul and Silas and Timothy. They were faithful ministers. What does that mean? They did according to the might of the Lord and the heart of the Lord. Not only that, when it says faithful, it means they were faithfully preaching the word. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 28. You speak the word faithfully. If there is anything that marked Paul out, it was that this word the Lord had given him, he spoke the word faithfully. And then because we know they are all faithful, the three of them, it means Timothy too and Silas too, spoke the word 
faithfully. And then we're told in Sir John verse 5 that you do faithfully whatsoever you are doing. Whatsoever they found themselves doing in the ministry, others might classify it. Some will say this is sacred. Others will say this is secular. Paul the apostle did not know anything sacred or secular. Everything was unto the Lord. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, whatever it is, you do it as unto the Lord. Was he preaching in the synagogue? Was he in the prison? Or was he with some believers? Or was he in his tent making job on the sideline? Everything he knew it was for the Lord. He was faithful in everything that he did. Secular and sacred. In fact, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 11, faithful in all things. That's the challenge the Lord is giving us as we look at these three men and we see their common characteristics that the Lord is calling us that we be faithful in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading there in verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The Lord is challenging us that as we look at the life of Paul the Apostle, and we look at our lives and ministries too, and much has been committed into our hands that the Lord himself will find us faithful. And uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2, and the things which thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. It means that the workers were raising up, the leaders were raising up, the people that are coming behind us, the people we're passing the baton to. There is one thing we're looking for in them too. We're looking for it that they are faithful. And it is as we examine them, we look at them, we scrutinize them, we look at their ministry, we look at their utterance we look at their family lives we look at everything they do and their messages too and we find that they are faithful before we then slowly gradually commit things into their hands you will not be in such a hurry to hand over things into the hands of people until you're very very sure in all things at all times unto the lord and to the word of the lord they will be faithful and they approve themselves that they are faithful please come back to first thessalonians chapter one and in verse 1 it says, Paul, faithful Paul, and Sy Silvanus, faithful Silas, and Timotheus, faithful Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us something here now. He says, I'm writing not to the city, I'm writing to the church. The city itself was established uh, about uh, 315 BC, that's before Christ, and uh, it was named uh, Thessalonica. Uh, after the name of the wife of um, the person that conquered of uh, Cassandra. And uh, this uh, place uh, was on at that time. And Thessalonica is still there today, but now the name has changed a little Thessaloniki. And uh, we have right there now about 300,000 people. At the time of the Second World War, Hitler went there and he got 60,000 Jews and massacred them, killed them. But the church was still there. And even till today, the church is still alive and well there. And that's the kind of thing you're talking about. The Lord preserved that place and the Lord preserved the church too. And the church has been on for many centuries now. Isn't that one reason why we should study about it? Because it's a lasting work. It's a work that endured. It was there at that time and the church is still there even today. Now it says they were a church. Was church ecclesia? It means the people, assembly of people, they are called out of the world. They are called out of their sin. And because they pass through the gate of the gospel into the kingdom of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb, totally transformed and changed. And they were not what they used to be anymore. Conversion has taken place. They became a church, assembly of redeemed people. Then he said, they were a church in God the Father, united inseparably to the Father. He is the Father, and they are his children. And he says, a church in Christ. What does that mean? They have been separated from the world and separated from Satan and separated from anything that is sinful or anything of sin and they are joined unto the Lord. He is the head and they are the body. It says this is a church 
called out people in Christ and in the Father. And then he says, now grace unto you. The grace they got initially at salvation will go through with them in life and even till the time of death. And then they will go beyond by that same grace of God. He said, then peace be unto you. The grace that came, the favor of God unmerited, give them peace in their heart. Sins forgiven. Now they had peace with God. And as they moved on, they will have the peace of God. And as they moved on, they will keep in peace with all men. Then he said, we're thanking God for you always. He said, we're making mention of you too in our prayers. Because Paul, the apostle, he had intercessory ministry uh, towards the people. The Lord had used them to win to the Lord. I come to point number two. Extraordinary conversions through a fruitful ministry here we find that the ministry of paul the apostle was fruitful please turn to first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 it says for yourselves brethren know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain that already tells you that the ministry that they had in thessalonica was very useful was very fruitful. He said, we know it, and you know it too, our coming in unto you, when we preach the word unto you, it was a fruitful thing, it was not in vain. And so, that's what the Lord is wanting us to do. That others will be able to testify that our going to a particular region, our going to a particular country, our going to a particular location community has not been in vain. Then he tells us in verse 3, it says, remembering without ceasing, chapter 1, verse 3, your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. He tells us now about the lives of these people. He's telling us uh, the evidence of the conversion, the evidence that a change had taken place. And he mentions three things. Number one is faith. Now you need to understand the relationship between work and and faith take faith on this side look up here here you have faith staying in this position before you came to faith before you came to christ you had a lot of works but because there's no faith in christ because you are not put your faith in christ all those works were dead they meant nothing they were the fruit of the human energy and because you are dead in sins and trespasses Everything you did before coming to faith, your sin, your deadness, spiritual deadness, affected it. They were dead works. Now you come to faith without works. Only because what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary availed for you. You say, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. You are born again. All your sins, they are transferred to Jesus Christ. He carried them away. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And now that you are born again, you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a witness in your heart. You are a child of God. Then the Bible says, we are created unto good works. It's then, works are important. Now you are born again. The faith in you will produce something. That's why it says, you Thessalonians, the work before faith, nothing. Useless. Yeah, it had no meaning. Now you are born again. Now you are children of God. We are created unto good works. That's the work of faith. It's a kind of faith that produces. And James tells us, if we have come to the faith, and then there is no work, no good works, we should examine that barren faith. Barren faith is dead faith in James chapter 2. James chapter 2 verse 17. Even so faith, if it, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Barren faith, dead faith. And then in verse 20, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead that is when you come to faith. There must be something it produces in your life. In verse 22, it says, Seest thou how faith wrought with its works? And by works, the faith was made perfect. In verse 26, For in the, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So Paul the apostle said, Thessalonians, I can see the evidence that you are in Christ. 
I can see the evidence that you are in the Father. And one evidence I see is that your faith works. Number two. He told them, I also know that you are in the Lord because of your labor of love. The love is talking about, and the love we should be talking about, is not a sentimental love. You know, there are people that uh, they say, I feel I love the children of God. It's in the emotion. It's in the feeling. It's not emotion. It's not feeling. It is an act. It is a will. It's a determination within you. You know that you are a child of God, and the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. Because of that love of God, shed abroad in your heart, that love towards God makes you to obey God, makes you to trust God, makes you to honor God, makes you to want to carry out anything and everything that the Lord wants you to do. And that love for the children of God makes you to just reach out to them. You want to help somebody. You want to be kind to somebody. There is something that that love is doing. And even the sinners outside, you are feeling as Christ is feeling towards them. And you want to love them. You want to contribute something to their lives that will draw them nearer Christ and draw them to the cross. That is the labor of love. It is by that love that we will show evidence we belong to the Lord. In John John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Must say 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you. That ye love one another. As I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know. That ye are my disciples. If ye have love one toward another. Come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In verse 3. He mentions three things there. Number one is the faith that works. Number two is the love that labors. Number three is the hope that endures. The hope that is patient. The hope that perseveres. Because these people, look at the First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. They were waiting for him. They were watching that the Lord was coming. And because they were in anticipation, expectation of the coming of the Lord, it, had, it put faith, it put hope in them. And if they were going through persecution, as they were persecuted, if they were going through any problem, they said, it will not be long. Our Lord is coming. And when he comes, he will make all things right. When he comes, he will reward us for what uh, we have suffered for. It was that hope that kept them on. In Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Reading from verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Look at verse 13. Looking for, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, do you know why we're living such a sober life, righteous life, holy life, and just life? He said, because of our expectation. Because of the anticipation. Because we're looking for that blessed hope. The coming of our Lord. That's why we're living the kind of life we're living. In First John chapter 3. Reading from verse 1. Verse 3 is actually uh, the one that mentions the hope. But to get the context, look at it from chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. That, therefore, uh, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we the children, sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Look at the hope now in verse 3. A purifying hope. A hope, a kind of hope that makes you want to live a holy life. And every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself even as he is pure. Please come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. It says, knowing, brethren, your election of God. Uh, there, are, uh, there are many schools of thoughts on this uh, election. Uh, there are people that feel that you are elected into the faith, into the kingdom, uh, without your consent. That God has decided from all eternity 
that you will be in the kingdom whether you like it or not whether you repent or not you are going to be in the kingdom the bible knows nothing like that when you look at the bible you'll find that the children of israel in fact god almighty said it's my elect and yet before moses died they want them he said when you get fat and then you begin to kick against the lord beware lest the lord will reject you even joshua warned the people when he was about to go he said you see the lord has fulfilled all his promises that he gave unto us our enemies are conquered he has given us the land then he said if you keep on to follow the lord then he will continue to bless you but if you forsake him then will you he will he cast you off forever and do you hurt after he has done you good have you listened to david when talking to solomon solomon my son uh, honor and fear the god of your father if you seek him he'll be fond of you if you forsake him he will reject you have you learned what jeremiah said oh ephraim ephraim my son how shall i give up ephraim he gave them up eventually because they will not go according to the word of the lord did you hear what jesus said oh jerusalem jerusalem how would have gathered you under the under my wings as a hen will do under uh, for the chiefs but ye would not therefore i leave your house to you desolate do you see what paul the apostle said in acts of the apostles seeing that you reject the gospel and you count yourself unworthy of eternal life we leave you and we go to the gentiles and therefore you understand that the election we're talking about god has a plan and God has his terms. And God has his conditions. And he says, whosoever believes, he will in no wise reject. How do you become elected? How do you become chosen into the kingdom of God? You hear the word of God. And when you hear the word of God, you accept, you receive, you believe the word of God. And the word of God is whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved and they will not reject you when you call upon him he said brethren i know you are elected i know you are chosen i know you are in the kingdom of god how do i know that i see a face that works i see a love that labors i see hope that perseveres and endures because of those signs i see in your congregation and in your life i know that the lord has chosen you in john chapter 15 verse 16 john chapter 15 reading from verse 16 here he tells us from the words of jesus christ himself he says ye have not chosen me but i have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit than that your fruit should remain now whatsoever ye ask of the father in my name he may give it unto you but then how did they come into the face we're told in first thessalonians chapter 5 chapter 1 verse 5 here is how they came into the faith. It says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much affliction. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. He said, This is the way you came. You heard the word of God. And when you heard the word of God, it was not just empty word. It was one that came by the Holy Spirit and it came in power as well. And that kind of power that assisted the word, backed up the word, brought conviction in them. And the conviction it brought in them led them to their knees and uh, then they were born again. They were saved. Please turn to John again in John chapter 16. John chapter 16 verse 8. It says, and when he is come, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and uh, ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. He said, when the Spirit of God is come, then he will reside in, his, in the children of God. He will reside in the sanctified believers. And as those sanctified believers are filled with the Spirit of God, and they declare the word of God unto their hearers, the Spirit of God will bring conviction for sin in the lives of the people, in the hearts of the people that are hearing the word. See an example, John, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. 
I read first the first part of verse 4. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. After they were filled with the Holy Ghost, look at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea, and all that dwell at Jerusalem, uh, be this known unto you, hearken unto my word. Remember in verse 4, he was filled with the Holy Ghost of the other people. And the power of the Holy Ghost was his life. And then now he stood up, he declared the word of God. What was the result in verse 37? In verse 37, now when they had this, they were preached in their heart. Conviction came upon them. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? When we preach the word in the power of the Holy Ghost, it brings conviction upon the people. As a result of that conviction, the people then come to the Lord. You see the conversion of the Thessalonians? That conversion came as a result of the impact of gospel preaching with unction and the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives. The minister's words energized, empowered by the Holy Ghost, and then the people are able to get on their knees and call upon the name of the Lord. Now I come to point number three. In point number three, we have uh, exemplary characteristics of a fair model. I want you to look at the characteristics of this church now. As we look at the First Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 6, And ye became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. And it says, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you. And now ye turned to God from idols, dead idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. There you find the characteristics of this fair model. Actually, it was like a real model church. Even in comparison with all the other churches in the New Testament, you will find that it was a model church. And then you find what uh, we have here, genuine conversion had taken place. And there was the evidence of a new life. And they, and they were characterized by what characterized the life of Christ. Think about it. As you look at these Christians and you match them with the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you find? As you read the whole thing, number one, you will find that there was love. Already we've mentioned that. And that characterizes us. Whatever we profess, if the love of God is not there, can we really say we belong to the earth? Number two, there was holiness. Holiness of life. They were in obedience to the watch of God. Number three, they had patience in suffering. Persecution came as persecution will always come because it says anyone that will live in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But these people, number three, they manifested perseverance, endurance, patience in persecution and suffering. Number four, good works. They had good works and they labored a lot, and they did things that showed that they really belonged to the Lord. And then number five, there was truth. They kept the truth of the word of God. I read it to you already. When you received the word of God, you didn't receive it as the opinion of men, ideas of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And then we have faithfulness. They were faithful. The ministers that preached to them were faithful ministers, and these were faithful members themselves, like pastor, like the people, like the leaders, like the laity. You find that as the leaders were faithful, they too, they were faithful. Number eight, or whatever number now, obedience. They had obedience to their faith, obedience to the watch of God. As you look at your own life, not just studying about the Thessalonians, you're asking yourself, do I have the characteristics in the life of a Christian? Is love there? 
Or am I so bitter with hatred? Am I always carrying something about? Pregnant with hatred? Uh, or is there holiness there? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Are you patient? In, are you patient in suffering, in persecution? Are you even persecuted at all? Or are you so much part of the world that the world does not see any difference between you and them? And there is no difference to, and there is no reason to persecute you? Are there good works there? Or are you always expecting others will serve you? Others will do something for you and you have nothing to do for them in return do you treasure the truth do you believe the truth do you accept the truth do you live by the truth are you defending the truth are you standing upon the truth that word of God once delivered unto the saints are you faithful to the word you have been given all the things you have been learned you have been learning are you like the Thessalonian church are you faithful to the Lord and faithful to Christ who has called you into the kingdom are you witnessing like these people and you see the characteristics here look at it from verse 6 it says he became followers of us they looked at the lives of their leaders and they said these are the people teaching us the word of God and the grace of God is not only to be operative in the life of their leaders that same grace coming unto them was operative in them as well and then followers of the Lord they said the Lord is a perfect example. He is the one that has saved us. And therefore they were following after his example. Then he said, even though they received the word in much affliction, they didn't say, well, if this thing were true, why are we going through so much suffering and persecution? They knew it was part of the deal. Jesus already told them that if the world love you, then you are not of God. But if you have God, the world will hate you. Therefore, don't be surprised when that comes. And then it says with joy in the Holy Ghost. Persecution was there. Problems were there because of the genuine conversion. And these characteristics of the fair model we're looking at, there was a joy of the Lord, which is their strength. And so in verse 7, you became examples to all that dwell in Macedonia and Achaia. And then in verse 8, the word sounded forth. Actually, in the Greek, it trumpeted out. It, 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 it blasted out the message from the life they were living. And then it says, even other people, they are telling us, they are, they are telling us about you. Actually, Thessalonica was a kind of a, a city that had influence upon the Greek culture because it was a cross, it was a center at a crossroad, and many people were going and coming. And because of the strategic nature of that city, then the people coming there, everybody heard about the church in Thessalonica. They saw their lives and they saw the various things that uh, the Lord had done there, and they were blasting it all about. And then it says they were patiently waiting and watching for the coming of the Lord who had redeemed them because they knew that one day the, uh, the apostle had told them when he was with them that Christ will come again and they were living their lives in daily expectation of the coming of the Lord. As I summarize this chapter and we look at them as a model church and then we look at uh, the points one by one and we see the evidence that they belong to the Lord and we're going back home and we're looking at our own churches and we're saying do I find this in our church do I find this in my local church do I find this let me give it to you seven points as I round up uh, briefly number one the present condition was the present condition verse 3 remembering uh, remembering without ceasing your labor your work of faith your labor of love your patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God it was not just in the sight of men look at the present condition of this church it was there it's not only I believe many years ago I trusted in the Lord many years ago there was a present condition that showed they belong to the Lord number two past conversion you find that in verse 4 knowing brethren beloved your election of God that are taking place already the Lord had called them they had the call of God they responded to the call of God and because of that there was a conversion that happened at a moment of time in the past but it had effect upon them right now number three penetrating conviction when they had the word of God, it brought a conviction in them that penetrated into their hearts in verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, 
but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. The word came and they had a penetrating conviction. And even though the apostle had let, left them and they were now away, they had to send Timothy back to them to find out how are you doing in the faith. The conviction they had at that time still remained. Number four, practical conformity. In verse 6, it says, Ye became followers of us. They conformed their lives to the people that are preached unto them. Because uh, these uh, people to you, that is the preachers, they had given them a good model. They had given them a, a kind of good example. And they said, the grace of God working in their lives will work in our lives. And also of the Lord. They were conformed unto the Lord. Isn't that the purpose of the Lord for our lives that he has called us so that we'll be conformed unto the image of a son? Number five, a powerful communication. Powerful communication. So that in verse 7 and in verse 8, so that ye are examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, because from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. They communicated the word of God in a powerful Full way. What they said with their leaves, their life confirmed. Number, number six is public commitment. Public commitment in verse 9 because they themselves, the public, the outsiders there, they show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turned uh, from, uh, how ye turned unto God from idols to serve the living and the true God. That is, all those that are worshipping idols, they brought the idols together. All those that had an magical thing, like in Acts chapter 19, verse 18, verse 19, they brought all those things together publicly and they burnt them and it became a public commitment they could not go back anymore the whole public now they saw them these people have left us they have left the works of darkness and they are following the lord number seven preparation for the coming christ preparation for christ that was coming they were now waiting it says and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come Again, I want to ask you yourself now, do you have all these characteristics yourself? Is there the evidence in your own life that there's true conversion there and then the people you are ministering to? Can we look at your church and then look at the Thessalonian church and say, praise the Lord. Look at their present condition. Praise the Lord. There is a past conversion. Praise the Lord because of the penetrating conviction and there is a practical conformity. There's a, there's a powerful communication of the gospel from leaves and from the life as well. And there is public commitment. All the community in that place, they know, those church, they know that church. They know they are the church standing on the word of God and they are the people preparing for the coming of Christ. I pray if it was not so before, it will be so this year. It will be so in your life. It will be so in my life. It will be so in all our churches in Jesus' name. The Lord did it in Thessalonica. He can do it in our church. Why don't you stand up and say, Lord, you've done it before, do it again. You've done it before, do it again. The Lord can do it and the Lord will do it. Uh, let's remember this church, a model church it was. Let's remember this church. See what God did with them and in them. And then pray that the Lord will do the same thing in you.